Hi, this is Kels Fikowski, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the Civil Rights Movement in about 15 minutes, and certainly this does not do justice to the Civil Rights Movement. However, this will preview many of the major topics that you need to know for the AP Gov exam. So, the backbone of the Civil Rights Movement comes from the 14th Amendment. Without the 14th Amendment, in particular, the Equal Protection Clause, as you see here highlighted in bold, you would not have had m many of the landmark pieces of legislation that comes out of the 1960s. And in particular here, the Equal Protection Clause is going to say you have to be able to apply the law equally. You cannot treat segments of the population differently, especially for reasons of race. Um, and that will be interpreted as such as we will see in the civil rights. So again, this idea that you have an equal protection of the laws. So undoubtedly, civil rights, these are policies designed to protect people against arbitrary or discriminatory treatment by government officials or individuals. And here you see sit-ins at a white-only establishment, uh, these men trying to advocate for their civil rights, and certainly a very scary and courageous time uh, for all that partook in the civil rights movement in the South. But there is a lot of discrimination, even just outside of race. You can be discriminated based on gender, age, disability, sexual orientation. Those tend to be the major topics where you find discrimination. But again, it's important to keep in mind what a civil right versus a civil liberty is. A civil liberty is something like voting or freedom of speech, right? Things contained in the first 10 amendments. Now, when someone of a particular gender or ethnicity or race has had to fight for one of these civil liberties so that they can have it and use it, such as the right to vote, then it is considered a civil rights movement. So theoretically speaking, all Americans have civil liberties. However, there are segments of the population who have had to fight for these civil liberties. And when you have to fight for these civil liberties, they now become civil rights. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, in terms of equality, uh, equality is not mentioned in the original Constitution, but the word equal does come about in the 14th Amendment as we talked about the equal protection of the laws. Um, and it's also keep in, in part to keep in mind that not all discrimination is unconstitutional. So, for example, uh, preventing a 90-year-old from joining the police department is technically age discrimination. However, it is legal discrimination based on a series of tests that we have here. There is what's called reasonable discrimination, which is relatively easy to meet, and it usually refers to age. For example, anyone who's under 17, uh, or under 18 for that matter, cannot vote. That is discrimination based on age. However, that is considered reasonable because people up until the age of 18 have not entered adulthood. They may not have a full understanding. They might be uh, easily manipulated by outside influences when it comes to voting. So it is considered a reasonable restriction. But as you get up on these discrimination tests, uh, the second one being the intermediate scrutiny, and that typically deals with gender. And if you're going to, for example, discriminate based on gender, it has to meet a substantial relationship to, the, to a government purpose. So, for example, having the draft only for males is considered... Uh, still legal under the intermediate scrutiny, even though males might say we're being discriminated against. Well, in the event of a war, the government does deem it necessary to trap males as opposed to females. And then the most difficult reason to basically discriminate is based on race, and this is known as the inherently suspect test. This is very difficult to meet, and this is dealing with race or ethnicity, basically saying that there is really no I mean, this is such a hurdle that it's almost difficult for any government policy to justify race. So, again, reasonable based on age, intermediate based on gender, and inherently suspect based on race. And certainly towards racial equality in the civil rights movement has come a long way since slaves first arrived in North America in 1619, all the way up to the passage of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in 1865. But, of course, we know that discrimination does not just end there. Um, you even before the civil uh, civil war, you had the Dred Scott decision, which basically said slaves have no rights. But then after the civil war, you have the passage of the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth amendment, and these are humongous uh, amendments that are going to certainly help uh, former slaves. Although, of course, we know after Reconstruction, uh, whites in the South are going to be very clever about passing these very racist. Uh, what are called Jim Crow or segregation laws, and they are going to allow the businesses in the South as well as the military to legally segregate. 
And these laws are upheld in a very famous case known as Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. This is not a required case, but you will need to know what that is called separate but equal. So the Supreme Court is going to say as long as the separate facilities are equal um, in terms, at least on paper, they are constitutional. And this allows for Jim Crow laws and segregation laws to continue. You will see that over time in the 1900s, starting in the 1930s rather, with FDR and then eventually Truman, they're going to be desegregating uh, specific areas of the government, in, in, especially in the mid-1900s, as we see with Truman desegregating the military. But again, even after the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, certainly you have a number of issues here that they are trying to fight you know, segregation and fight for civil rights. And certainly a very uphill battle. And one way that the uh, NAACP is going to be very instrumental as an interest group is coordinating with the Legal Defense Fund. And this is pivotal because they're going to be using the courts and they're going to be making some headway. Remember, when interest groups aren't succeeding in other areas, such as in Congress, they are going to resort to the courts as a last resort. And they're going to be very instrumental in outlawing white primaries, protecting innocent blacks accused of ridiculous crimes with no evidence, uh, and then eventually desegregating schools with the help of Thurgood Marshall, who will eventually serve on the uh, Supreme Court. We'll also talk about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, as well as the impact of the Board of, uh, at Brown v. Board of Education uh, case, the Selma March, as well as the influence of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., certainly very important. And speaking of Dr. King, um, the letter from a Birmingham jail, a separate video on my YouTube channel, um, I incur highly encourage you to read it yourself um, because it is such a powerful document, and he leads a peaceful march in Birmingham. He's arrested for demonstrating he's going to spend 11 days in solitary confinement, and he's going to lay out a framework for nonviolent resistance. And he's going to basically say, you know, people have a moral obligation to break these unjust laws. He's even going to reference that Hitler and everything that he did was done legally under Germany's law. So he's now going to be advocating for direct action. It's going to be conf confronting this injustice head on as opposed to sort of, you know, waiting for the courts to deal with this or, you know, having a boycott. Instead, you're going to be seeing more marches, sit-ins, and he's going to also be responding to white clergymen who are going to say that, again, you should be arguing against racial segregation in the courts as opposed to the streets. And he's going to be very eloquent in laying out very key arguments against um, you know, this opposition. So uh, again, this doesn't do it justice, but I highly encourage you to read the entire document and consult my video for a fuller understanding of this very, very powerful document. Now, key legislation that is going to be passed during the Civil Rights Movement is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, making, uh, making racial discrimination illegal for businesses. And one way that they actually do this is they're justifying it in this particular Supreme Court case through the Commerce Clause. So since travelers are coming out of state, they're calling that interstate commerce, and therefore Congress is trying to justify the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Supreme Court is going to agree. It also is going to strengthen overall voter right legislation. It's going to forbade employment discrimination based on race, and then even create a special bureaucracy called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to ensure that there isn't racist you know, discrimination uh, based on hiring practices. Along with that, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that the government cannot deny an in individual the right to vote based on race or color. This is going to outlaw literacy tests. This is going to allow for federal government uh, officials to use um, ele election inspectors. And it's also going to establish what's known as preclearance, that states need permission before enacting new registration policy. That's going to be very instrumental. And then along with that, you're going to have the 24th Amendment, which is going to officially outlaw poll taxes. So Voting Rights Act is going to be very important in helping uh, blacks be able to vote, oftentimes for the first time. Now, the reason I show you this picture, and this is supposed to be Ruth Bader Ginsburg in this comic strip here, um, there was a Supreme Court case a few years ago that threw out preclearance from the Voting Rights Act. 
And the argument was that, well, it's not needed anymore, that, you, you know, these states, before they enact a new voting procedure, don't need to consult the federal government, specifically the Department of Justice, because look at all these people voting. So Ginsburg actually writes out in her dissenting opinion, uh, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. So certainly uh, looking at a different side here. But uh, you'll note that there are significant increases, particularly in um, Mississippi. We're going to see the percentage increase from 1960 to 1966. Huge, huge, huge gains here. And the Voting Rights Act is going to be instrumental in that endeavor. And then Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, another very important uh, case here that's going to overthrow the separate but equal doctrine from the Jim Crow laws. Linda Brown here uh, is going to try to gain admission into a school closer to her house, but it was a whites-only school. She's going to be denied uh, based solely on her race. The NAACP, as well as the Legal Defense Fund, are going to use the courts. They're going to challenge this. And as we know, they are going to succeed under the Warren Court. Um, and Thurgood Marshall is going to be the head lawyer for the NAACP and the Legal Defense Fund and uh, really help uh, overturn these Jim Crow laws. And the problem, though, as we know with the courts, is that they lack implementation power. And what's crazy is that you'll see that some of these schools in the South have taken a very long time to desegregate. Um, and I'll show you this particular slide here that, you know, almost uh, 10 years later after the decision, the percentage of African-Americans attending schools with whites, I mean, not a lot. I mean, look at, uh, for example, um, Mississippi, 0.02%. So really not a lot of gains there in that regard. But one of the reasons why they're going to uh, rule unanimously in favor of Brown is because of, of that equal protection clause. Again, so fundamental. And they're going to say that schooling and public education is a foundation of good citizenship, that children are not just going to be affected in terms of inadequacy of, you know, lower, you know, not so great schools, underpaid teachers, lacking of resources. I mean, even if that was even, the Supreme Court is going to argue that, you know, this is going to affect children's hearts and minds. They're going to be made to feel inferior. Um, so as a result, uh, this is going to lead to the demise of Jim Crow laws. Now, there's actually a second Brown v. Board of Education case in which it's going to argue about the importance of desegregating schools with all deliberate speed. And that's going to be very important in terms of, you know, making the South sort of speed up uh, desegregation. Now, there are some issues that are going to remain after Brown v. Board of Education. Busing, in, in particular, is going to be a, a controversial issue. Um, but again, you can outlaw segregation by law known as de jure. Um, but the de facto or the reality of it is that you know whites are going to come up with their own ways of where they're going to sort of sidestep this ruling, where you're going to have whites leaving city areas known as white flight or white communities not selling or renting homes to blacks. So you still have segregation basically happening. So even though it's illegal um, by, re, you know, by factor and by reality, um, segregation is still remaining um, after that. Now, some lingering issues after Brown, you know, even dealing with today is something called affirmative action, where this is a policy trying to help some previously disadvantaged group. The idea is you give them more employment opportunities and protection uh, against those who have been discriminated against. That equal opportunity is going to lead to equal results. The idea being that if you have, you know, a disadvantaged group, that hopefully if you gave them, give them permit, uh, which I say, give them preference, let's say in college, that this will help break the cycle of poverty and a lack of education and hopefully help them after you know decades or centuries of discrimination. Now, ultimately, affirmative action is going to be held to be legal. However, it cannot be based on racial quotas, as per this uh, Supreme Court decision, and it cannot be considered a bonus or a plus. That's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. But again, schools can still use affirmative action to increase uh, racial diversity, but it cannot be based on a a point system that gives them a, a plus, and there cannot be quotas. So I will leave you with this image here, whether or not you agree with it, something certainly to think about as this is one of the lingering issues 
uh, involving race and schools and uh, certainly a very contentious topic. So that was my attempt to cover the civil rights movement in terms of what you need to know for the AP Gov exam. Certainly, I, I encourage you to look at these issues and these documents and court cases much more specifically.